Good afternoon, second grade. Uh, I've decided that we could do a couple of extra biographies beyond what was included with our lessons, and some of them still have just as important lessons for us, and that's why today I've decided to read you the story of the youngest marcher. It's the story of Audrey Faye Hendricks, a young civil rights activist. It's by Cynthia Levinson, and it's illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton. This story takes place at a time when in the American South, states had laws which were known as segregation. They may also be called Jim Crow laws, but people, uh, white people and people who were not white were not allowed to mix together. They had to eat in separate restaurants. They had to ride in different parts of the bus. They went to different schools. They couldn't use the same drinking fountains. And sometimes it seems that there are times where we've all experienced something where we're not allowed to do something that somebody else does. And so I thought that this might be a little bit inspirational for us, the youngest marcher. Whenever Mike flew into town, Audrey and her mama cooked barbecued ribs, stewed greens, sweet potato souffle, and Audrey's favorite, hot rolls baptized in butter. Other folks knew Mike as Martin or Dr. King. The Hendrixes used his nickname. They did the same with uh, the other ministers too, like Fred Shuttlesworth and Jim Bevel. After Mike blessed the feast, Mama expected Audrey to keep still during dinner. But when grown-ups talked about wiping out, wiping out the segregation laws that kept black and white people apart in Birmingham, she just had to speak up. Audrey intended to go places and do things like everybody else. I want to eat ice cream inside Newberries. I want to sit downstairs at the Alabama. I want to... <clears throat> I don't want hand-me-down school books. But stools at the counter, plush movie theater seats, books so fresh that they'd crackle when you open them, those were for white children. Hush, hissed Mama. Nine-year-old children should not speak in front of the uh, company, especially ministers like Mike, Fred, and Jim, who are, who are bringing dreams of justice. Audrey knew all about segregation. She knew to pay the driver at the front of the bus, then step off and walk around to the back door. She knew to drink from the fountain with the dirty bowl and the warm water. To use the freight elevator at department stores downtown. Front row seats, cool water, elevators with white gloved operators. Laws said that those were for white folks. Every Monday night, Audrey and her mama and daddy and her aunts and uncles and cousins joined neighbors and friends at Fred's church for worship, fellowship, and testimony. She sang and swayed along with the movement choir, her voice spirited and spiritual, black and white together we shall overcome. For once, she didn't have to keep still. Then came the testimonies. White store owners won't hire me. Ku Kluxers chased me. Policemen called me names. The hateful stories made Audrey squirm. 
She tried to tell her mama, That's not right! Shh! How could mama expect her to hush? She had come to make things right, but what could she do? When Mike visited Fred's church, thousands of people crowded around to hear him preach. In a voice as taut as steel cables, as smooth as glass, he intoned, Segregation is morally wrong and sinful. That's true. Fired up, Audrey sat taller. An unjust law is no law at all, he proclaimed. Audrey had listened to Mike explain the plan at her supper table and knew what he meant. If, an unjust, if a law is unjust, disobey it. Sit down inside Newberry's. Picket those white stores. March to protest those unfair laws. Why, why even marching was against the law. Then get arrested. Fill the jails, Mike exclaimed. Fill Birmingham's jails so full that policemen can't squeeze in one more person. Pack the cells so tight that the police will have to quit arresting people for demanding their rights. Audrey just knew Mike's plan would work. She twisted in her pew to see which grown-ups would walk down the aisle and volunteer for jail. But they mostly stayed put, eyes staring at their feet, hands on their knees. Feet, hands, and knees didn't move. Fill the jails, Mike pleaded, after meeting after meeting. But heads shook. All around her, Audrey heard, No, best not to break those segregation laws. The boss man will fire me. The landlord will evict me. Policemen will beat me. If nobody protested, Mike's plan would fail. Police could keep arresting anyone, anytime, for anything, forever. Audrey would never be able to go to places and do things like everybody else. One night, Jim announced a new idea. If grown-ups won't do it, fill the jails with children. Audrey leaped to her feet. I want to go to jail, she declared. Mama looked deep and saw that Audrey's eyes begged please. Okay, Mama said. Audrey strutted down the aisle. She was going to jail. Two mornings later, she put on a fresh-pressed pinafore dress and shiny Mary Jane shoes with turned-down socks. Protester, protesters got to look nice. In the meantime, her daddy bought her a game to help her pass time in jail. Her mama and daddy took her by the Center Street Elementary to tell her teacher that she'd be absent, maybe for a whole week. Miss Willis wrapped her arms around her. Audrey knew she was proud of her. Then she said goodbye to her grandparents. You'll be fine, her grandmother said. She knew Audrey would be brave. So did Audrey. Then her mama and daddy drove to the 16th Street Baptist Church, where the children were gathering. Even before she reached the door, Audrey heard loud voices chanting freedom songs. Inside, hundreds of big kids called out to friends and crowded around signs for, high, for their high schools. Parker, Carver, her head swiveled. 
Where was the sign for Center Street Elementary? She was the only protester from her school, the youngest child in the whole church. She knew no one. Audrey huddled by her parents in the basement. But when Jim lined her up with the others, two by two, and the door swung open, Audrey straightened up. She was going to break the law and go to jail to help make things right. Clutching a protest sign in one hand and her game in the other, Audrey marched out the door. She stomped and she sang, Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Half a block from the ch from the church, a white policeman stopped Audrey. He pointed towards a police van. Sentence, one week in juvenile jail. A matron locked Audrey into a day room with two dozen other girls all older, all bigger, all strangers. Audrey sat down alone and slipped the cover off of her game. I told you to sit down, the matron yelled. Audrey jumped. She didn't remember standing up. The matron dragged her to a dark, empty room. When I tell you something, you do it, she commanded, or I'll leave you here. Trembling, Audrey quietly followed the matron back to the day room, put away her game, and lay down on her bed and cried. Jail was harder than she had thought. She wasn't fine after all. By evening, Audrey was hungry and tired for dinner, soupy, oily, tasteless grits. At night, a bare mattress with one thin sheet for a cover. Audrey and her cellmates were led outdoors into an empty concrete pen surrounded by high prison walls. The older girls talked together. Audrey wondered what her classmates were doing. Miss Willis was probably keeping them busy. On another day, Audrey was sent to a huge room and told to sit in a chair that was so high her feet dangled above the floor. Four white men glared at her. She'd never talked to a white man before. Are you against America? One demanded to know. No, sir, she answered politely. What <clears throat> What do you talk about at those meetings? Asked another. Our freedom. Why did you march? To go places and do things like everybody else. What was wrong with that? Every mealtime, Audrey stared at greasy grits. She could barely spoon them into her mouth, let alone swallow them. Every night, the cot's wire springs jabbed. Every morning, she had nothing to do but sit alone with her game.
in the afternoon, in the afternoons though, more kids crowded into the day room. Some days, many of them arrived sopping wet. A girl explained that firemen aimed powerful hoses at the children. Surging water spun them off their feet and down the street. They got up and kept marching anyway until they were sent to jail. By the fifth day in detention, the police couldn't squeeze in one more person. We filled up all the rooms. We filled up all the rooms. Audrey practically jumped up and down. She was so proud. We filled up all the rooms. Watching television in the day room, she saw black people stole right into stores and restaurants like they belonged there. No one else could be sent to jail. Everything had been changed. After seven days, Audrey went home. Her mama and daddy wrapped her in their arms tight around her, washed the jail off of her, And for dinner, hot rolls baptized in butter. Two months later, the city of Birmingham wiped the segregation laws clean off the books. Audrey licked her spoon clean at Newberry's counter like everybody else. Black and white together like we belong. There's an author's note. Every day Audrey Faye Hendricks spent in jail, her mother, Lola, called someone she knew there to make sure that her daughter was safe. The day after her release, Audrey returned to Miss Will's class. She didn't tell her classmates about marching or jail, though. It didn't dawn on me that it was a big deal, she said. But it was. Audrey was one of the more than 3,000 children who were arrested in Birmingham, Alabama in May 1963. The Children's March, which was planned by Reverend James Bevel, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., affected not only Birmingham, but America. That summer, young people who held protests in nearly 200 cities. President John F. Kennedy spoke on television about prejudice and sent a civil rights bill to Congress. On August 28th, 250,000 people marched in Washington, D.C. to hear Dr. King preach about his dreams of freedom. I had the honor of talking with Audrey in her home, where she grew up. She showed me the table at which Dr. King blessed the meals, and the upright piano where she practiced singing civil rights songs including, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Audrey told me that she remained an activist afterward. She volunteered to integrate a high school, enrolling in one of its first, as one of its first black students. Uh, it took her a while for, it took a while for whites and blacks to work together, she said. But it was what we fought for. After graduating from college and working in Dallas, Texas, Audrey returned to Birmingham where she taught preschool and led Head Start programs. Years later, she earned a graduate degree uh, researching women like her mother and herself who were involved in the civil rights movement. Schools around the country invited her to speak about her experience as the youngest known marcher. Nicknamed Civil Rights Queen, 
Audrey Faye Hendricks died in 2009. We're talking the real story of a real person. About the age of a fourth grader. So she worked to bring black people and white people together. We have a lot of work to do. I, now is the time where the marches are for m missing and murdered indigenous women. And we need to make sure that the, your voices are heard. We need to make sure that civil rights continue to expand to every American. That being said, this is a little bit of a long book, so I'm only going to ask one question, and that is, what idea do you have to try to make things better so that we can all get together and live happily and in peace? So I, Audrey Faye Hendricks showed that the young have more influence than, than you may think. So who knows? Maybe one of the ideas I see in your notebook might be something that we can actually do in the community. And I look forward to seeing it when we're back together. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and be proud of who you are. Thank you.